door. We're starting this organization called Modern Spirit. We want to promote, you know, this kind of information and related information. So this is our first event. So this is my talk, Integrating the Modern Practice of Traditional Ayahuasca Shamanism. Next slide. So I've been rearranging uh, the slides, different versions for different places. Uh, here's a little bit about my background. So um, I went to, to medical uh, school down at UCSD, but I did found medicine here at UCLA, here in LA, in LA before. <coughs> and I began traveling to the Amazon in 2007, and I've been slowly working through a shamanic apprenticeship there in the Amazon. So I wanted to share my experience. So I, uh, I'm one of the co-founders and co-owners of Niwerao Centro Espiritual. It's a healing center, traditional healing center in Peru outside of Iquitos where we do uh, Amazonian shamanism and, and ayahuasca ceremony. So this is a group, last year we're, we're naturopaths and medical students from Arizona are coming and here we have 10 groups, so as a doctor I'm trying to educate people, giving opportunities for medical students, naturopaths, people to come through and visit us and learn uh, traditional medicine there from South America. Next slide. So me, what am I about, you know, what is this whole thing about? As a doctor, you know, I'm going through all that training and then doing this, I'm just, I'm interested in this connection of bringing the healing back into healing. And so it's about reintegrating science and the healing arts. And it's, it's, you know, informed by my training there in the Amazon, you know, spending so much time in ceremonies, so much time training. This is, I think, the MRI at Scripps uh, Center for Integrated Medicine, where they try to include some sacred geometry you know, into the space where some of the diagnostics is happening. So now I'm a doctor here in America, you know, and we have this very unique cultural situation here in healthcare. This is a movie called American Addict. They describe this documentary and say 50% of the world's prescription drugs are currently being consumed in the United States of America, you know, with our healthcare system and the pharmaceutical industry and the advertising and the marketing and the medical education. 80% of the world's prescription narcotics are being consumed here in the United States of America. So we have a very unique, like, it's a cultural problem, you could say. It's happening here. So it's a cultural problem, this materialist culture, this uh, rat race culture. Very unique situation in healthcare that we're in here. And you can see there's, there's a problem. Next slide. So how do we address this kind of problem? You know, I'm a big fan of Maladoma uh, Somme. He is a shaman and a scholar. He has two PhDs. And he's, you know, wrote this beautiful book of Water and the Spirit. He says, at this critical time in history, the Earth's people are awakening to a deep need for global healing. African wisdom, or I would say like traditional wisdom, so long held secret is being called on to provide tools to enable us to move into a more peaceful and empowered way of being both within our, ourselves and within our community. The indigenous spirit in each of us is calling for cleansing and reconciliation. Next slide. So he says that traditional medicine, you know, spiritual medicine, can inform us, it can help reorient us, you know, in this culture where we seem so lost, you know, depending on all these things, and still not as healthy as other people in other places. And we can reorient, our, reorient ourselves again to become earthlings, you know, to remember we're from here, this is where we're from, we've always been from here. And so he recommends, like, to heal these kind of problems of this modern society, this modern civilization, three things that you can help to connect people with that will make a big impact with a lot of problems is reconnecting them to nature, to community, and to a ritual ceremony, you know, spiritual practice. This is a view of the Maloka down there at night, courtesy of Carlos Suarez, a photographer. Next slide. This is our center down there. Uh, we're there on the edge of the Amazon rainforest coming out of Iquitos. This is the planes fly, their flight path is over our center, so once somebody actually managed to catch it on the plane, and that's it right there, and so, you know, at night you hear every time, every 9.30 of the ceremony, the plane goes by, and you know where you are. So that's the view of our center, as you can see, the, that's the kitchen, and all the stuff in Maloka, there we are, okay? That way is National Forest, and the Amazon, as far as you can see. You know, this way is a little village, and, and some other stuff. So it's a great place to explore this reconnection in the Amazon with nature, with a healing community, you know, like Maladomo says, the community can hold a space for you that you may not be able to hold for yourself. You know, maybe you, you can tell your community, hey, I want to be like this, a loving community, you know, not, a, not a problem community, a loving community. I want to be like this, but you know what, I can't do it. Well, they'll hold the space for you. That's the traditional way. 
So then you can go and you can fill that space. And then in our case, ceremony. You know, as we guide people through ayahuasca ceremony as a, as a spiritual practice, as a mystical healing. Next slide. So uh, we're, this is our center again. That's the office. Uh, like I tell people, I sleep in there a lot of times and it's paid for. So you guys don't have to worry about mortgage and stuff like that. Uh, it's a traditional Amazonian healing center. We're, since 2011, we practice traditional Shipibo, shamanic and plant medicine of the Shipibo culture of the Yucayali region. It's a water, you know, river basin, upper Peruvian Amazon. And we heal through plant medicine, traditional Shipibo diets, I'll explain a little bit, with monster plants and other healing plants. And yes, we do provide traditional ayahuasca ceremonies. Next slide. So there's the Peruvian upper Amazon. You know, there you the, the peoples are from here from Fukaba, but then we are in Iquitos, and a lot of people are going to Iquitos because that's where all the tourists are coming, you know, this famous ayahuasca tourism. It's a little more tourist friendly there. So the shamans are going there too, you know, to meet the need of these people coming down. Next slide. So there's this Amazonian medical tourism going on, this ayahuasca tourism, you know, that we participate in. It's that a lot of people are concerned. Thousands of travelers are now coming every year to the Amazon for healing, for learning, for exploration. For them. Those seeking shamanic healing are most often coming for problems which they have not yet found relief. A lot of the people who come to our center, they've been to the doctor, they've been to the psychologist, they've been to a lot of other things. They're coming to us because nothing else is working. Uh, so things that we would regard perhaps as psychological problems or psychiatric problems or psychosomatic problems, or if you will, spiritual <coughs> problems, you know, from the traditional perspective. Next slide. So you know, ayahuasca shaman, they told me this was in LA Weekly about know, a month ago, I think. Remember you guys saw it, ayahuasca can change your life so long as you're willing to puke your guts out. <laughs> Next slide. This is uh, the first time I saw ayahuasca being cooked when I went for the first time. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and this guy's wearing a Phoenix Suns hat. You know? That was a big surprise. So he's cooking some ayahuasca there at, at the, uh, in the Amazon. So I say ayahuasca tea here to be prepared. It's part of a traditional Amazonian plant medicine tradition. It's not just ayahuasca floating around there. There's a whole system. There's a whole culture. And that's one of the things. There's a lot of other plant medicines, a lot of other techniques, a lot of other considerations. Next slide. So here's, here's some ayahuasca. So what is ayahuasca tea? Ayahuasca tea, maybe a lot of you guys already know, but it's made primarily from two plants. There's a lot of ways to make it, but this is one of the main traditional ways. This is how we make it. So you have ayahuasca, the vine, the many stereopsis vine, also known there as, you know, Madrecita Ayahuasca, Madre Ayahuasca, that's like a mother nature spirit is regarded of the Amazon. Okay, mother nature of medicine, of plant medicine. Next slide. So then, you know, we and a lot of people mix the ayahuasca then with chacruna, chacruna leaves, you know, the psychotria viridis. So you cook that together to make the tea. And that's how you make the tea. The chakruna is the source of this, you know, magical, the tryptamine, the DMT, you know, that people are very interested in. Next slide. So DMT is this, you know, really strong hallucinogen that is also being identified now within the body, that is inside our own bodies, inside, you know, and it seems to be inside our own minds. At least they, I think they just discovered that, yes, it is in the, the mouse pineal gland in the brains. And so there's DMT, the spirit molecule, another book where the Rick Strassman psychiatrist from University of New Mexico is, is exploring the possibility of, hey, you know, if this DMT is inside of our cells, and then if we give you enough dose of it, and then you launch it to a mystical experience, like maybe this is part of our own endogenous mystical machinery. Maybe this is what happens to people when they have mystical experiences. Maybe the DMT, maybe in near-death experiences, maybe in death, or in birth, or maybe in their dreams, or somewhere along the line, this is going on, this machinery is, is being activated. So then they also made DMT and spirit molecule moving. And there's the molecule there. So, uh, well, next slide. So then this drug versus ayahuasca medicine, you know, because, oh, it's a drug, how's the drug, you know, it's a drug. And then in the culture, you know, in the traditional culture, it's not thought of as a drug. This is a traditional plant medicine. And it's quite offensive to the shamans, you know, to be categorized in the drug category. They say, like, the car of the shaman workers is that's the drugs are the ones that showed up with you guys. You know, he's like, we didn't have one drug. We didn't have one. He's like, that's the one that you take, and it's, they have the side effects and this and that. And, you know, it's like, this is, is a medicine. And so, a lot of people are very focused on DMT, 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 DMT. That, that ayahuasca is just like a DMT delivery device. That, you know, you could just smoke the DMT or just inject the DMT. 
because there's this ayahuasca effect, the pharmacological effect, that if you try to eat the jacuna leaves, the DMT will be broken down in your stomach. So you need to take it with the vine so that it, it slows that breakdown and it allows it to be absorbed into your body and into your brain and it prolongs the experience. So there's a big focus on, oh, it's all about the DMT. But, you know, traditionally the tea is not named for the chakruna, it's named for the ayahuasca. The ayahuasca, the whole plant spirit, the ayahuasca, with the help of the chakruna, is connecting you, it's a gateway to plant spirits. You know, that's the idea traditionally. So this, just the, just the single hallucinogenic molecule, that's just the formula of the visions, you know. That Chakruna brings the visions, that's the belief. But the ayahuasca is the medicine, you know. That's the strength of the medicine, the strength of the purge. People are like, oh, I just smoke DMT, then I don't have to throw up, I don't have to have diarrhea. And it's like, well, the medicine is throwing up, it's having diarrhea, you know. It's, that's part of how people get better. Um, so, and it's not a counterculture thing, it's not a hallucinogenic counterculture, it's the most traditional thing in their culture. We do the ceremony with the grandma there, you know, with the little kids there. It's not people escaping family, running away from relationships. It's part of the tradition. Next slide. So, just a little update, you know, so ayahuasca controversy. So ayahuasca is, you know, controversial here in the United States, basically illegal. But there have been some, uh, you know, in Rose UDV, the Unidad de Vegetal Brazilian Church, one right to, to practice, you know, uh, their religion, which uses ayahuasca in their ritual, their ceremony as part of their church, and they now have legal right to import ayahuasca through the DEA. So there has been some progress. Next slide. So peyote medicine, and that's how I got my start, depressed in medical school, looking for help, looking for hope, and peyote, the peyote way, that's what saved me. You know, that's what got me into all this. And, and so I just say, you know, Native American culture provides the foundation for peyote and ayahuasca medicine, and our relationship with Native America shapes the integration of these medicines. Next slide. So then there's now there's MAPS, you know, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies. I don't know if you guys are aware of this organization, but they're promoting a lot of psychedelic research. They had their conference this year, big conference, 2,000 people with medical credit and all this stuff, psychedelic science. Next slide. So what are some of the breakthroughs, you know, what's going on with psychedelic research? There's a renaissance of psychedelic research happening now in science again. You know, some of the big focus areas are MDMA, the, the ecstasy, the molly, that they're now uh, using in uh, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. You know, initially just for people, trauma victims, perhaps from rape or sexual abuse or some other things. And then eventually, yeah, the veterans, war veterans, and now police, firefighters, you know, very conservative elements of our society who are looking for help. Psilocybin from the mushrooms for end of life anxiety. You know, people who are dying from cancer and there's no, they're not gonna get better, but they're freaked out to die and so their last days are ruined. And so they have a mystical experience, you know, that opens them to, uh, to greet death. This study was, you know, one of the main ayahuasca studies to be published. They ayahuasca assisted therapy for addiction. So they had a little preliminary study in Canada. Next slide. Let's get more mate, I believe, yeah. That's, he's involved in that work. Okay, there's those other guys are the authors. So they had working with addiction and stress. Uh, they had these four days of group counseling and two us for the ayahuasca ceremony. So they had some statistically significant in a small group, you know, improvements, hopefulness, empowerment, mindfulness, quality, and meaning in uh, life and meaning outlook scale. So they, they they saw a change. You know, they saw a change, a significant change that is leading to more research now that made an impact clinically. So now the Ayahuasca Treatment Outcome Project has been launched out of Canada under Brian Rush. So now they want to do more serious, intense clinical research to show how Ayahuasca can help addiction. Next slide. This was a meeting that, to explore this at Tarapoto in Peru with the Jacques Mabin and his center in Takiwasi where they treat addiction with traditional plant medicine and Ayahuasca. And so now that's starting to gain traction. Next slide. So now getting back to, to my whole story of this thing I was trying to talk to you about, of, you know, trying to bring the science together and learn from the shaman. So I'm interested in the, in the developing role of traditional spiritual medicine in modern society from the perspective of a medical doctor. And I'm looking for the intersection between Amazonian shamanism and allopathic medicine. Okay, that's what I'm down there trying to check out. Next slide. So my thing is like, you know, there's this mystery that science, you know, doctors and that whole world, they want to ignore, you know, that we are not allowed to talk about or we're supposed to just pretend like we don't have experiences related to that. 
but still, you know, there is a mystery, and there's this interface with the mystery that has to be addressed. And you know, shamanism and spiritual medicine are are, uh, are dedicated to that. So I say, whether or not we conceive of anything beyond this life, we must admit that there are at least two areas of our lives that are still very mysterious and appear to interface with that which exists beyond our understanding. You know, first mind. All these geniuses of neuroscience, neurosurgery, and all this stuff, you know, people can't explain, like, how we think. The nature of our consciousness, it is a mystery. So if they're telling me that there's no mystery, but he's talking out of his mouth, you know, it's like, that's a miracle as far as we know. You know, we don't understand. And so, you know, some people, Deepak Chopra and Graham Hancock, or maybe our brain is a receiver, a transceiver, connecting to this communal consciousness, you know, and just receiving stuff. Feeling, our feelings, you know, they want us to deny our feelings. I'm supposed to disregard, you know, how somebody feels about it. So they tell me they feel, you know, oceanic boundlessness and love beyond anything that their mind can conceive. And yet, you know, science is supposed to just kind of look the other way. But now they aren't looking the other way. There's meditation research that's looking at these type of things. So I say, you know, this world of, of mind, this world of feeling, is there, you know, whether we want to talk about it or we don't want to talk about it, there it is. And we know that it's related to mystery, at least something that is beyond our understanding. Next slide. So there's a lot of ways, I think, that in our culture, even, you know, conservative aspects of our culture regularly interface with this mystery. Like I said, thought. You know, if we want to be honest, well, we have to admit that thought is a mysterious phenomenon. Memory is still a mysterious phenomenon. Our dreams, you know, if they want to disregard our dreams, that doesn't mean anything, that's nothing, but it doesn't feel like that to me, and, you know, not to a lot of people. Imagination is a mystery. How do we imagine things? How are things revealed to us through this imagination? We don't know, yet it's part of this same logical, rational world of science that you're imagining things all the time, but no one wants to talk about what is this imagination? But we live with it every day. You know, then there's inspiration. Then it works, you know, and when it comes to sports, you know, everyone's very welcome to bring in superstition. And you can feel the energy in the room, you know, cut it with a knife and a rock concert. Oh, that's allowed. We can talk about all kinds of things over there, you know. Even the scientists and everybody at the rock concert, they're feeling it, you know. But not so much in the research. But it's growing now. Then people who are like open to spiritual, faithful things, you know, prayer, meditation, ritual. And then we get into this psychedelic experience, which a lot of people have had. And they're touching into this myst mystery, mystical thing, mystical states. Johns Hopkins is using psilocybin, you know, from the mushrooms, like as a possible model of the mystical experience. You know, so many people get, go into these realms when they are under the influence. Near-death experience. Okay, next slide. So here's kind of a cool book, you know, on near-death experience. Here's even Alexander, MD, he's a neurosurgeon, he was the head of... Harvard neurosurgery for some period of time that, you know, was a very rational guy that deals with a lot of people with serious head trauma, comas, that describe all kinds of experiences to him. But he, you know, he's a doctor, he's a scientist, he's like, it's, it's cute, you know, he just kind of shines him on. And then he goes into a coma for seven days, and they're observing his brain, and it's dead, full of infection, as far as no, it's not working. And his experience for those seven days is he went to, the, to heaven, into all these higher dimensions, and they explain to him all these things about love and understanding, and he's dedicating the rest of his life to spreading this message. So, next slide. <coughs> so, now, this interface, you know, with the thing, so I'm saying mind, feeling, mind, feeling, where does it exist in the body? You know, where, where can we talk about physical anatomy of the body? So there's this field called psychoneuroimmunology, this growing thing of how the psychology that we do admit is connected to our brains to some degree, it's connected to our nerves, that is then also connected directly into our immune system, you know, and into our endocrine system, to our hormones. So here's an example, you know, the brain connected to the adrenal glands, you know, your adrenal glands, and then connected into a bunch of uh, immune cells, white blood cells and stuff. So you have this relationship, you know, of one of the main focuses of like the stress response system, the stress response system that people are so worried about, cortisol levels, things like that. It's this relationship between the brain and the hypothalamus and the pituitary of the brain talking to the adrenal gland that's letting out this cortisol, you know, the stress response and the way that communicates with the immune system. And all this is getting spelled out now. All this is getting pretty well articulated, you know, and they're finding that, hey, we thought these one chemicals, these messenger chemicals, we call them neurotransmitters because they come out of the brain. And then we call these other ones hormones because they're coming out of the hormone glands, the endocrine glands. And we call this other one, you know, uh, cytokines and inflammatory markers because they're coming from the immune cells. But it turns out the immune cells are putting on neurotransmitters too. 
and the, and the hormones are putting out cytokines and inflammatory markers. And it's kind of arbitrary, this compartmentalization, and actually we're looking at a network of systems that are using the same kind of molecules to communicate. So we have this network, and this is the network that's being looked at in questions like, how does stress affect your immune function? Why do people who are all stressed out get sick more often? Or does that relate to cancer, their ability to fight cancer? Stress leading to high blood pressure. Depression written, leading to disease progression. Somebody has heart problems, but then they're depressed. They do worse than the person who's not depressed. In the system, they study it to see how that's related. Chronic inflammation from fighting some illness, some cancer, just the inflammation in your body, or from your diet, or from all this stuff, leading to depression. All this inner relationship is being looked at. Next slide. So I'm not the only person, you know, there's a lot of people who've been talking about this for a while. Here's Gabor Mate again. When the body says no, understanding the stress-disease connection. Another cool book, Esther Sternberg, The Balance Within, The Science uh, Connecting Health and Emotions. This is like, these topics are big, you know, it's not being talked enough about, you know, in medicine, but it's, it's very well studied. Next slide. So here's another, a little more complex slide that I want to try to relate to you guys. So there's another, there's psychoneuroimmunology, there's psychoneuroendocrinology, you know, the same kind of thing, it's the same basic idea. The brain, the psychology, connecting it to your hormones, connecting it to your immune system. So here you see this system, you know, the cortex, the higher brain, you have this hippocampus, amygdala, hypothalamus, that part of your brain, connecting into this adrenal cortex, like I just showed you guys, connecting to your immune system. So this is this HPA axis again. The hypothalamus, H to the pituitary, to the adrenal, HPA axis, the cortisol levels. This is this famous stress response system that people are getting more and more interested in. See people who are overstressed and their HPA axis is thrown off, their stress response system is thrown off. So this is the system that was now very well described. Next slide. So the hippocampus, the amygdala, hypothalamus that I just showed you guys in another slide, that's all part of the limbic system. So there's this limbic system in the brain. And this is like an emotional processing center, an emotional center in the brain. Next slide. So what is this limbic system? You know, what are, what are the things that we know about this limbic system? Well, it's linked to uh, episodic autobiographical memory. So certain uh, memories that are associated with a sense of ourself and the past, our emotions, our goals, sometimes mental reliving of an experience, emotional processing, social processing of emotions, recognizing people's facial expressions that are informing me of their mood, their emotion, dream, sexuality, all these elements, you know, it's all part of the limbic system. And for me, I'm reading this list, and I'm like, wow, that sounds a lot like an ayahuasca ceremony to me. Next slide. So the limbic system and the autonomic. So it's funny, this limbic system that we're describing, you know, that's this emotional processing center is directly wired into our autonomic nervous system. This automatic nervous system that we have that controls all of our function. I'm going to describe it, but you know, our breathing, our heart rate, all these parts of our body, the subconscious body. And so this emotional center, this limbic system is handling sensory input from outside the body. So a lot of stuff that we're seeing, touching, feeling, that's coming in and it's being integrated with what I feel inside my body. So how do I feel about what's going on? What's going on? How do I feel about what's going on? That integration is happening there in the limbic system. So the limbic system is managing our autonomic nervous system, our physical subconscious, integrating this input and output with our emotions and the physical expression of our emotions. You know, that automatic function. Sad and all the things, the faces we make. Next slide. So here's the, here's the limbic system, you know, connecting to the autonomic nervous system. So you can see now where there's areas where stress and anxiety and all these things are directly linked to some bodily functions. For example, you know, you see some people having asthma attacks related to anxiety attacks, you know, tightening of their breathing, you know, their bronchioles. Stress leading to constriction of the blood vessels and heart rate, and you get high blood pressure from this relationship. You get, you know, what are they saying? Stimulate glucose production, stress, you know, causing cortisol, causing all this sugar, 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 diabetes. Stimulating digestion, people with all this like reflux and acid problems, you know, it's like every patient that I see at the clinic, it's like everyone's on antacid medication, you know. Like that's just normal to be on antacid medication. Yeah, some of it's diet, but some of it is, you know, people get ulcers from stress and this is the kind of mechanism. Digestive problems, you know, all this irritable bowel syndrome. And then you throw in some other inflammatory stuff and you get into some of these autoimmune inflammatory problems, some inflammatory bowel disease, some people with Crohn's, some people with ulcerative colitis. You see this relationship. You get into these bladder problems, you know, pain problems, urination problems, erection problems, all these things, you know, you're sweating, you're crying, 
All these things managed by the limbic system. Next slide. slide. So then here's a, here's a big PTSD researcher, uh, my friend Raphael turned me on to, Vanderpoel. He says you know, the brain stem, so that's like the lower brain, the hypothalamus limbic system, that limbic system we talk about, the neocortex are in concert, monitoring relation with the outside world, and assessing, assessing what is new, dangerous, or gratifying, what I was just talking about. It's just constantly trying to assess what's good for me, what's not so good for me, how do I feel about this, what should I do, how should I react. And uh, so this is like, you know, basically what our intuition, our gut feelings, our inner guidance, you know, this is this all coming from this thing. And this system can be maladapted and it can be disturbed. Okay, this system that's trying to integrate what's coming in, how we feel about things, what's going on inside our body, it can be disturbed. Next slide. So, search of feelings, you guys know. Yo, I don't need to tell you guys, I'm the source. Next slide. So, I'm saying the emotional body, you know, this emotional body, has a physical basis. It's not too touchy-feely after all. Doctors, you know, we can start talking about this emotional body. I'm saying the emotional body is this limbic system connected to the autonomic nervous system, connected to the immune system, connected to the endocrine system. And that's what a lot of the other traditional cultures have been saying for a while, you know. People have been linking up the chakras to certain endocrine glands, certain hormone glands, and showing, okay, these are the centers. This is the relationship between the physical body and the emotional subjective body and the experience. And I'm saying this is where we find it in the, in the blood, in, in the, on the MRI, on the CAT scan. Next slide. So maybe now we have something to talk about. You know, we have something to talk about this emotional body, this subtle energy body that a lot of other traditions have been talking about for a long time. This is, uh, you know, uh, Alex Grazo showing this, this energy body, trying to bring it to life in visions. Next slide. So they did a study in Finland, and they asked people, this is on NPR, they asked people, where do you feel these emotions in your body? Just ask them that question. I don't know if they had to draw on a map or whatever they did, but then they showed all the, like, crossover. All this crossover. You know, you see shame, and they're blushing in their cheeks. You know, this... Anger, I showed it to my friend who studies Chinese medicine. He's like, oh yeah, we say liver fire, you know, I'm raising up. Liver fire coming up in anger. Love in the, in the heart, in the, in the heart, in the mind, and down low. All these different things. All right, next slide. So this emotional body, this energy body, this subtle body, you know, that spiritual medicine and practice I've been talking about for a long time, it's related to these things we're talking about. Next slide. So I'm saying limbic energy body, all right? So now I'm calling it the limbic energy body, or somehow I'm trying to come up with some terminology. So memory, memory itself, you know, people who study memory say memory is imagination. Like me making up, you know, did Fred tell me three times or two times? I say it's three times. But, you know, at some point I'm imagining that. You know, I'm retelling the story, this idea, this narrative that we tell ourselves. This narrative. So memory is imagination. So emotional traumas get frozen in the body past affects the present, you know, until it gets recontextualized, gets reimagined back into the flow. So we have this system that I've talked about, the limbic system to the amygdala, you know, which is a big part of the stress response system, and the hippocampus and related to memory, and the pituitary related to all this flow, and then the pineal gland, you know, they talk about the DMT, that's there. Psychoneurology, psychoneuroendocrinology, autonomic nervous system. Similarly, the acupuncture meridians, you know, TCM, chi flow in the body. Similarly, Hindu metaphysics, Ayurveda, the subtle body in the chakras. This idea that emotional traumas can get stuck in the energy body, you know, and they need to be reimagined, re reoriented. So these, all these traditions have this idea of energy blockages and stagnations. Next slide. So the same guy, the PTSD researcher, he's he says this, in talking about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right, from war, from all these other traumas. While transformation of memories of day-to-day -day experiences is the norm, the flashbacks and other sensory re-experiences of PTSD seem not to be updated or attached to other experiences. Triggered by a reminder, the past can be relived with an immediate sensory and emotional intensity that makes victims feel as if the event were occurring all over again. Patients with PTSD seem to remain embedded in the trauma as a contemporary experience and often become fixated on the trauma. This idea of trauma being lodged inside themselves. Where? You know, in their mind, in their emotional body, in their energy body. Next slide. So, he's the one saying, he's doing all this research, and I heard him speak the other day, he tells me, this guy's out there saying, I did all the PTSD research, you know, we need a limbic focused approach to deal with these people. 
It's at that depth, this emotional depth limit to the problem. Uh, the antidepressants, the medications, they're not working on this frozen trauma. They've been studying it. They've been trying to do the research. They're not getting results. So I'm saying it seems like this is a disturbance in the emotional body, this limbic system we're describing. Next slide. So then here's an example of uh, Russ, a friend of mine, that I was a, one of the first people I brought down to Peru for healing. He's a Vietnam vet, you know, he's been through treatment for, it's Vietnam, you know, it's been decades that he's been seeking treatment, tried, you know, antidepressants and therapy and all this stuff. He's in the ceremony, the first ceremony that I'm helping out in, what's happening to Russ? Russ is seeing, and he's not the only one seeing it, several people saw this, he's seeing these like dark leeches, you know, surfacing into his body, uh, running out, you know, scurrying across the whole maloka, and then the shaman starts singing to him, Ricardo starts singing to him, and now, you know, blue sparks are flying out of them. Now things are getting ripped out with nails on them, you know, getting pulled out. This idea of this trauma, this energy, this stagnation being pulled out of his emotional body. Next slide. So now I'm going to introduce one more topic that I want you guys to, to, to learn about. Um, this is epigenetics. I think this is another, this is a huge revolution in biology, epigenetics. And so it's really important, it's really relevant, and people need to be informed, updated. Epigenetics is this new biology, genetic software versus hardware. You know, everyone's been so focused on genetic hardware, like my DNA genes, this is my family has this, and now I have this. It's my sequence, there's nothing I can do about it, that's my destiny, you know. But there's a whole software associated with the genes that's been discovered, the epigenetics. Epigenetics means like that which is covering the genes. So, for example, this DNA sequence to be packaged into the cell so tightly, you know, that it goes from here to the moon and back. It's like the sacred geometry of proteins that package it in there. So it's, it's totally coated in these proteins. And so the DNA itself can be affected by DNA methylation. There's different ways to mark the DNA. And then the histones, the proteins that's packaged in, they can be marked and affected. So there's all these epigenetic factors that can do it. What, what kinds of things cause this kind of marking? Well, development, you know, in utero stuff when you're in the womb, childhood, things that happen to your childhood, for example, environmental chemicals, all this toxicity, all this pollution, etc., etc., drugs, pharmaceuticals, aging, diet, lifestyle, you know, social interactions. So that's the kind of stuff, you know, that's all these stories of our lives, of what we've lived, you know, that affect our genes. There it is, we have the mechanism. And what are the health endpoints? that are being looked at as being of epigenetic origin. Cancer, you know, autoimmune disease, a lot of mental health problems, diabetes. Next slide. So epigenetics 101, a little brief overview of epigenetics. So at least, you know, I think we can get all the different people to agree, whatever their beliefs that, you know, most people from an egg and a sperm starts there, right? Next slide. So then, this one cell that we start at turns into all these other cells, right? It gets differentiated. One cell is now you get a muscle cell, or you get a fat cell, or you get a bone cell, or you get a nerve cell. So it's the same DNA. They all share the same DNA. But it's largely epigenetic imprinting, you know, that tags them, marks them, and allows them to respond to other factors. That allows what was just this DNA that's going to make only this cell can now become all these other cells. That's how powerful it is. Next slide. So, for example, you can take a sheep mammary cell, a cell from a sheep's mammary gland. Next slide. And you can eventually mess with it, go forwards and backwards with it epigenetically until you get Dolly the sheep. Next slide. So, stem cells. You can take these adult cells that are already formed, then you can deprogram them and make stem cells, pluripotent stem cells. And then you can reprogram those ones again to get these other things, largely epigenetic. So this is has a huge influence on our biology. Next slide. So here's another uh, example that came out a little while ago from these guys, Institute of Functional Medicine, their kind of research. You know, this is diabetic mouse, this fat, you know, uh, yellowish mouse is the diabetic mouse. It's like, oh, is it genetically? They're born that way, they breed them that way. And then they take one of them, these two are just genetically identical, and that one, the brown one, the little skinny brown one, was how the mouse was originally, they just, while it was developing in the womb, they fed the mom these supplements, you know, choline, folic acid, betaine, and vitamin B12, and that was able to reverse epigenetic damage, uh, you know, maladaptive stuff. He got him back to being a skinny brown mouse again. Next slide. So then another one is like, this, this is another study just came out, 
This parental olfactory experience influences behavior and neural structure in subsequent generations. So a mouse, they can, they can stress it out, you know, torturing it, stressing it, relating to some smell. To the point where now it's Pavlovian, anytime it smells that smell, it freaks out, you know, the stress response comes on. That stays with that mouse, stays with the children of that mouse for generations. They're marked for generations, epigenetically. And what is that for? You know, well, one of the things it's for, and it's, and it's like healthy existence, is your instincts. You know, they're tuning to their environment, and then that generation is going to be born with instincts set for that environment. But if your environment is just toxic, you know, then you're being tuned for that. Next slide. So Time Magazine, you know, why your DNA isn't your destiny, the new science of epigenetics. So lifestyle, nutrition, environmental toxins, psychological state, development in utero and childhood, family life, social experiences, being crucial in cancer, diabetes, autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, etc. Mental health problems like anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction, cognitive mood disorders. Next slide. So back to Niwe Rao. You know, here's us at the center working with these people. So I'm saying, okay, we're trying to deal with their, their emotional body, their energy body, their limbic system, etc. And uh, we're trying to address it with these approaches, nature, community, ceremony, practice. Next slide. So here's our center, these are my partners. First, Ricardo Maringo, master Shipibo healer, shaman. Some of you know him. My other partner, Svita Mamik healer in her own right, artist, visionary artist. So we, you know, it's an integrated team between the three of us, me and the doctor, and we have an art maloka where we do visionary art, we have visiting healers sometimes, we do some acupuncture or some body work or different things. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I'm saying that this place here in the jungle, it's a nice place to address the emotional body and the epigenetics through spiritual medical intervention. So you got this nature, you got this clean environment, detox, clean out, get away from the toxic environments, the community, the healing relationships, the supportive relationships, and then you have the mystical component. Next slide. So ours is, you know, it's traditional medicine with Western integration in the sense that there's translation culturally, you know, we were working with the Shui peoples to bring this medicine to all of us, you know, coming from a different background. That's us back in the day with Ricardo had long hair. Next slide. So what do we do with people? This is what we do. People show up, you know, this is the typical treatment. You put on a people healing diet. This is traditional people medicine. This is how we work with people. This is how we heal people. First step, vomitive. You have to throw up. You take a plant mix. It's going to make you throw up to start the cleaning, start the process. Next, you're going to review your intentions. You're going to meet with Ricardo, and possibly the shamans, or with myself, or speak to with somebody to discuss why are you here. You know, how are we going to help you? How are we going to initiate this process with you? From that, you might be assigned a master plan, different from ayahuasca, okay? Not necessarily psychoactive at all, but a plan that's being used primarily for its spiritual properties, you know, and maybe some of its physical properties to help you. Coca, marosa, piña blanca, chitisanaga, for example. Then you're going to be on this vegetalista diet, possibly in isolation. And that's, this is, these are the main components of your treatment. Then additional plant treatment. Maybe you're going to get some topical plant treatments, you know, some poultices. Maybe you're going to do some plant baths with vapors, or maybe you're going to do direct plant baths. And then yes, you know, after all that is set in motion, when the time is right, you come to ayahuasca ceremony, you know, where you are not obligated to drink ayahuasca, but it's an opportunity to drink ayahuasca. So we do that Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday of ayahuasca ceremony, and there you're going to receive healing some, whether you drink or you don't drink. The shamans are drinking and they're going to sing to you, and that's the healing song. Then we have post-ceremony conversation and counseling and groups, one-on-one, -on -one, that's as much as we can do. And then you continue that diet process until you close that diet in ceremony. So that could be days, that could be weeks, that could be months, it could be one year, uh, depending on, on what your needs are, continue. So here's the maloka, this is where we do the ceremony, that's the maloka, I'm going to next slide. So the ceremony, you know, we usually uh, have Ricardo with at least two shamans. Sometimes there, now there's a third there. There's a wheelit who's left us for now, but there he is. Next slide. So the ayahuasca ceremony, the Icaros, we're going to talk a little bit about some experiences. Uh, that's, that's another topic, but that's what we, we talk about all the mystical, magical things that can happen there, or just healing things that are happening there. Next slide. 
So, me as a doctor sitting there at the center, seeing the people that are coming, you know, the people that are getting some success, they're making some progress, and just wondering, huh, like what kind of problems do I see people do well with, with us? What kind of problems do they tell their friends? Hey, you know what, they help me with this, you should go there. So we have this like little family of, of disorders. So I'll say, you know, yeah, emotional, psychological trauma, major, you know, major reason why people can do it. Sexual trauma, very common me, like, you know, reason, common reason people come down. Anxiety, depression, PTSD, addiction. And then like this autonomic dysfunction stuff I was talking about, you know. Some people with allergies and asthma that responds to our treatment, headaches, migraines, problems like that related to this autonomic dysfunction, this emotional body stuff. Some autoimmune disease, you know, we've had big success with psoriasis. One case, multiple sclerosis, big success. One, not so much. You know, a lot of emotional healing, though. Ankylosing spondylitis, what somebody respond. Psychosomatic illness, you know, so chronic fatigue. Uh, that, you know, as a doctor, what do we offer those people? You know, we give them all, you know, antidepressants or something. Chronic cough. Some people have these coughs that are associated to emotional trauma. They've had the, the pulmonary function testing. They've had the CAT scans. They've had. They spent thousands of dollars. They still have this cough. Nobody knows why. And then you treat them, you know, somatically, spiritually, have an emotional healing. They get better. Some forms of body pain. You know, I talk about post-infection immune dysfunction. Some people have mono, and they don't get better. And they don't get right. You know, the doctor. We don't have anything to offer them at that point. Helping those people along. Next slide. So what do these cases share from a Western perspective? Do they share any common physiological features? So I say, well, the patient will tell the story of integration, you know. I don't have to, as a doctor or talking to the shamans, try to explain to you where it comes together. It comes together very clearly. Medicine work comes together very clearly with the patient. The patient gets better. Okay, so let's hear what did the doctor say was wrong with them? What did the patient say is wrong with them? What did the shaman say is wrong? Next slide. So the shaman saying traditionally it's like, well, this person's emotional, their energy body's compromised, there's all kinds of energies in there that need to be straightened out and cleaned and cleansed and regulated. And so that's the traditional perspective. Next slide. So then here's a woman that came uh, for five, five months of treatment, really, you know. So some of the treatment is prolonged. So she did one month with us in the center, went home for three months, stayed on the diet very strictly, stayed taking plants, and then came back and finished one month. So the first month and the last month had ayahuasca ceremony involved. So she was struggling with fatigue, you know, depression, low back pain, knee pain, struggling with her weight, you know, getting to a point at 32 years old where she's having a hard time mobilizing, she can't walk around, it's too much pain, my back, my knees. You know, the kind of thing you don't see down there so much. You know, these people in the jungle, they don't, they don't go down like that so much. But here it's pretty common as a doctor to see that kind of thing. So, she did this five month process, you know, she lost this weight, you know, she's dieting, it's very strict, so she's losing weight, but she's retreating, she's organizing her life. And then through ceremony, she realized she had been a victim of incest, in addition to a lot of other known emotional abuse that she had to work through. And this was resolved through spiritual work in ceremony, through the diet, supported by the master plants. Next slide. She handed me this book. At the end, when she came back, she's like, Joe, have you read this book? She's like, this is what you guys did for me. This is where I got all this like, curiosity about the limbic system. She handed me this book. The patient tells the story of the integration. She says, Joe, read this book. You healed my limbic system, she told me. They talk about your general theory of love. They explain it. So she's saying that by healing her limbic system, from what she understands, she ended up with weight loss, this resolution of depression, increased energy, resolution of knee pain, back pain's getting better, she's hopeful, she's thriving. Next slide. So this book, you know, The General Theory of Love, very interesting book describing the limbic system and its role in, in, in health. So the limbic system, they say, is like this mammal system, you know, it's the mammal system with this attachment, the mother and the child, you know, the way we care for our youth, like, uh, you know, the reptiles are not so concerned. But we, you know, the dogs and everybody, you know, taking care of the babies and these relationships, you know, that are so important for us as social beings, as human beings. So, our emotions are regulated by our relationships with others. And this system develops in childhood. First with our parents uh, or caregivers. This is the attachment you know, that people talk about. And this tuning in to our caregivers, tuning in, the development of our emotional system is based on our relationship with others. And perhaps like our very identity and our ability to relate to ourselves is secondary to that, to learning about relating to others. Next slide. 
So we learn to regulate our emotions through subconscious interaction with our parents, caregivers, through emotional cues. Like I say, you know, uh, there's a loud noise, the baby's upset, looks right at the parent, you know. What's the scene? What should we do? You know, if the parent freaks out, oh, the baby's going to freak out. The parent tries to calm down, okay, maybe it's not such a problem. <laughs> so that constant, that constant interplay, and we all do that with each other constantly. It is our instinct as human beings that we're just constantly scanning the emotional state of the people around us to assess where we are at. So if there's problems in this process, this is one example of where the limbic system can have difficulty with this process in childhood, you know, in relating and in, in developing this emotional system through our relationships. Uh, you know, you can result in long-term emotional difficulties and difficulties coping with stress. It's commonly seen. Next slide. So the limbic system, as we said before, it's linked to this episodic autobiographical memory, this emotional processing, this social processing, facial expression, recognition, dream, sexuality. Next slide. And this is just kind of like the, the, the concept of this limbic system, of this whole, the brainstem, the reptile, the, the whole system, territorial, all these basic functions, and the limbic system, this social system. Then you have this neocortical, the human system, you know, abstract thought, all this thinking of planning. Next slide. So this is Amanda Sage painting. So limbic resonance is this concept put out there by a general theory of love, so that we, uh, it's the capacity of sharing deep emotional states arising from the limbic system of brain, emotional attunement through subconscious cues. It's the way we turn into each other's internal worlds. This we call it limbic resonance. You know, I tune into you, limbically resonate. Next slide. So there's limbic regulation, mood contagion, or emotional contagion. So this is the effect we have on each other's moods. We resonate with each other and then we influence each other. And we can limbically bond, you know, with certain animals. And, uh, and this affects the development and stability of our personality and our moods, so our community influences this next slide. So then this limbic regulation shapes the development of our limbic system in childhood and beyond, subconsciously leaving subconscious imprints on our personalities and moods, affecting our future lives. For example, our choices in relationships, abusive relationships, people that get wired and tuned to that, that they seek abusive relationships, that they'd rather, it's more painful to leave the relationship than to stay in the relationship because of how they've been developed and formed. People who are seeking substances to regulate their emotions. Next slide. So limbic revision is this third concept that they put out there in general theory of love. So limbic revision is the therapeutic alteration of personality. Okay, residing in the human limbic system of the brain. Improving emotional health, stress coping mechanisms, and choices in relationships. So one example that they're promoting in general theory of love, they're focused on psychotherapy. So psychotherapy, they're saying, you know, it doesn't really matter what you talk about. What you need is to be in there with somebody who you can limbically resonate that's going to reflect love, you know, so that you can start tuning into that, tuning into that, start getting regulated, and then revised, you know, and over a period of time with a loving therapist that over a few years, your know, love and love and support will rewire your brain. Next slide. So this 32-year-old woman that came, she thinks that the traditional dieting, the support with the master plans, the traditional ayahuasca ceremonies guided by Shipibo masters and their ikaros led to limbic regulation changes and eventual limbic revision over a shorter time course than psychotherapy. They're saying three to five years. You know, in five months, you made a huge progress. So I'm saying, you know, the nature, there's a, there's a cleanse, there's a period of purification with the diet, there's an epigenetic benefit, there's a supportive community for the limbic revision, and there's ceremony, you know for her to do mystical limbic revision, for her to, through love and forgiveness, you know, reimagine these experiences and reorient and put back into the flow her memories. So versus what would we have done, you know, as doctors, she's, they, I don't know, you can put on chronic antidepressants, oh, you have a chemical imbalance, you know, this new idea from the drug companies and everything. You have a chemical imbalance, you should be on Prozac for the rest of your life. You know, that's the answer for you or your back pain, your knee pain, no, that's not related, let's just let's focus on the knee, let's focus on the back, let's do this, let's do that. And just spin your wheels, you know, spin your wheels. And nobody's getting better. You know, I'm visiting, I step in these clinics, you know, and some people are getting better, a lot of people aren't getting better, you know, with this kind of approach. Next slide. This is a little shamanic image for the fun of it. Next slide. So people primarily come to us at our Center for Emotional Healing, I'm saying limbic revision, which is then treated through a larger uh, related spiritual approach and context. Psychotherapy is thought to work through prolonged limbic regulation with therapists. 
lar largely subconscious process, resulting in limited revision from this book, from general theory of love. In many cases, anecdotally speaking, traditional approaches, which include the ritual use of ayahuasca, can be much faster and it can also be effective for limbic revisions. So I'm saying, give us a chance. You know, this is a problem that we have in our society. This is a big problem, you know, these series of problems that I listed up there. That that's what people aren't getting better from going to the doctor. I know, I'm there, I'm watching them. Come back, come back. Next slide. So there's Ricardo Chilling. This rapid limbic revision through traditional treatment may in part occur through epigenetic changes. Next slide. <coughs> So spiritual illness, you know, this family, I'm saying, okay, now it's limbic dysfunction, neurolimbic dysfunction, the same series of problems that people are coming to us for. So we're saying this is spiritual illness, this is emotional energy body problems, this is limbic dysfunction, neurolimbic dysfunction. These are the problems. Next slide. So the Shakibo perspective, what do they say about these people that are coming through getting healing this way? What do they say about her? They say, oh, you know, they need limpieza. They need cleaning. We have to clean them. We have to clean this accumulated bad energy, this darkness that's accumulated in them from their lifestyle, from their relationships, from their toxic environment, from their diet, from all these things. These are, they, so they heal by working to clean the spirit and energy body, the accumulated dark experiences, the energies, the traumas, the spirits, if you will, the pain, the emotions, grief, sadness, anger, blockages in the emotional body, energy body. Next slide. So traditionally, if untreated, these energies result in illness. So that's what Ricardo's was like, oh yeah, you know, these people, they have this stuff built up inside them. They don't, they don't have a shaman. They need a shaman. They need somebody to clean that. So they're 20 years old. They feel good, you know. 30 years old, ah, oh, they start having some problems. 40 years old, they're sick. They don't feel good anymore, you know. So the whole focus of what goes on in the Moloka is limpiar, centrar, abrir, clean them, clean them, you know, get them clean. Then once they're clean, center them, you know, get them straight, and then open them again, you know, to the rest of their lives. Next slide. So I was down in uh, South Africa last year, and I was surprised. Here's a Zulu Sankoma, a traditional healer. Similar concept ex exists throughout all these traditional cultures. Here in like the Southwest, and the Mexicans, and the Native Americans, you know, limpias, they do these limpias, these spiritual cleanses. Down in South Africa, a lot of ritual cleansing, these ritual baths at the river, this idea of ritual bathing. They also do plant baths like the Shipibos do, vapor treatments like the Shipibos do, and a lot of vomitants. You know, I was like, wow, these are totally isolated populations, having the same approach trying to address these kind of problems. Next slide. So does allopathic medicine recognize accumulated energies, this idea of accumulated energies, you know, like the way the shamans describe this dark energies, so I say, yes, there's this allostatic burden and load. It's this concept that's, that's coming out of psychoneurobiology and, and integrated medicine. So allostasis refers to our way that we adapt to stressful situations. And so these stress adaptations accumulate in the nervous system in the body, affecting our stress response. So every time we're stressed, we have to adapt to that stress. So our stress response can become burdened over time by accumulated stress that doesn't get relieved. And so our stress response is sometimes going to be modified, sometimes overburdened. Next slide. So allostatic load, chronic stress. So there's these certain biomolecules, and they're following like adrenaline levels in the body, or cortisol levels in the body, or certain inflammatory markers in the body from the psychoneuroimmunologic apparatus that I described earlier. So these are things that mediate stress in the body. They have protect protective and adaptive benefits in the short term, but in the long term, if they're overproduced over time, you know, they cause problems when they don't get resolved. So they talk about repeated stress, too many new stresses. You're unable to adapt. The stress is too much for you to adapt to. Or you can't turn off the stress response <coughs> fast enough, delayed shutdown. Or just inadequate response. The stress is too much, your body cannot meet it. Next slide. So this is the stress response system that we were talking about before, you know. This hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal cortex. This is what they're studying in all this allostatic load, cortisol levels and immune reaction to that stuff. Next slide. So allostatic load and PTSD. So Russ, this, you know, he had the accumulated energies of war that led to maladaptive stress response system. You know, PTSD is the classic, like maladaptive stress response system. Their cortisol levels, their you know, reactivity to stress, it's all screwed up from all this trauma, this accumulated trauma. And yet, you know, PTSD is this big focus of psychedelic research right now because it's responding to this kind of treatment. And, 
you know, ayahuasca as well. Next slide. So migraines, you're saying, well, migraines, it seems like it's a maladaptive brain response to stress. Repeated stressors alter the normal response of the system. The brain responds abnormally to environmental conditions, so they start crossing their wires. This smell turns into this. This light turns into that. This food, this allergy, all of a sudden becomes this other thing. Because the stress response is overburdened. Next slide. So there's a chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, in high allostatic loads. So this chronic fatigue syndrome, this fibromyalgia, these kind of problems that are really popping up quite a bit. They're saying, hey, you know, these people are showing signs of a lot of high allostatic load. So they have like their cortisol levels, their renefrin levels. It looks like their stress response system is overwhelmed. And you know, this thing that we're linking to the emotional body. Next slide. So I'm saying accumulated energy, stress from childhood maltreatment, for example, psychological trauma like combat leads to increased allostatic load. Allostatic load represents maladaptive functioning in our psychoneurologic apparatus, like the stress response system, the HPA axis, which includes our immune system, which I'm saying is all part of the emotional body that we described. And it leaves us with less capacity to cope with stress and often leads to further long-term pathology, like migraines, chronic fatigue syndrome, PTSD. And these are the problems that traditionally we describe as traditional uh, spiritual illness. Next slide. So biological memory of childhood maltreatment. So we're saying where this childhood maltreatment that gets locked into people, that stays with them their whole lives, where does it live in the body? So it's saying, you know, it can lead to lasting alteration in core physiologic systems, the biological memory of childhood maltreatment. And it can even be transmitted to the next generation, these alterations. And, you know, effects on the stress system, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis, our immune system. And they're saying, hey, you know what? It seems like it's happening through epigenetic imprinting. That's one of the places it's happening. It's software. Software is being altered. Software that can be altered and then unaltered, hopefully. Next slide. So that's a classic reason people come to us. You know, it's ayahuasca almost always brings up people's childhoods. Uh, maltreatment or trauma, neglect, abuse, very common problem that we see people come and you know, stare at the ceiling in the Maloka for. Next slide. So this attachment theory that we talked about before, they talk about the dynamics of long-term relationships between humans. The most important tenet is that an infant needs to develop a relationship with at least one primary caregiver for social and emotional development to occur normally. And this relationship sets the tone for limbic development. So this aspect of childhood versus later life trauma. But this aspect. So they do all these monkey studies with these rhesus monkeys, you know, and they give them these neglected childhoods. And they give them a choice between a furry mom with no milk and a mom that has milk but is just wired and they go to the furry mom. You know? And they start messing with them and try to figure out what's different about the ones. Because the ones that they neglect, they stay disturbed for the rest of their lives. And so then, what's different about them? Where is the imprinting happening? Where is the biological memory of these uh, emotional traumas? Next. So these guys did this study, and what they were showing is that, you know, early life adversity is associated with a broad scope of lifelong health and behavioral disorders, the broad impact on these epigenetic things, this DNA methylation, epigenetic changes, is where it seems like you can see the difference between these two in the limbic system and in structures related to the limbic system. You can see that this emotional trauma, this imprinting that happened is partially software, epigenetic. There it is, waiting for an intervention, perhaps. Next slide. There's another study, you know, we're saying epigenetic me mechanisms of depression and antidepressants. It's like, oh wow, maybe this is increasing evidence that supports the hypothesis that aberrations in chromatin remodeling, which is an epigenetic phenomenon, subsequent effects on the gene expression within limbic re brain regions contribute to depression and other stress-related disorders, such as PTSD and other anxiety syndrome. I'm saying this is limbic software. Next slide. So I think we should explore the possibility that we at the Ayahuasca Healing Centers are cleansing allostatic load, pathologically imprinted epigenetics from our emotional centers, which by the way are hardwired into our tears and into our vomit. And that these are the mechanisms, you know, of the spiritual plans that we're doing with Ayahuasca. Rapid limbic revision. Next slide. So, you know, back to Gabor Mate again. You know, Gabor Mate writes his book in the realm of hungry ghosts about addiction. It's like and everyone's talking about they inherited the alcohol gene and all this stuff, and it's like, if you're a biologist, why would you evolve an alcohol gene? You know, where would that come from? But you can definitely show, and he's saying, you know, he's worked with these deep addicts over in Vancouver all this time. He's like, without question, without exception, major childhood maltreatment and abuse 
and you know the possibility of epigenetic stuff passing on from their parents who also went through something similar and also you know have the experience with the substances. And so he's saying, you know, it's really a search for love. That's why people are taking these substances. That's why they're shooting heroin. You know, it's just like feels like a warm hug to them. Next slide. So we had a guy, you know, this is an exceptional example, this not everybody like this, he was a particularly motivated individual who was doing cocaine all the way to the airport. You know, he's not a, he's not a hippie or anything, I mean this guy is an oil patch worker from Alberta, Canada, he just works the oil rigs and all that stuff and he's out there drinking monster drinks and doing cocaine with all his buddies, you know, going hardcore, and he's got a cocaine problem, big time, and barely even really described it to us. So we did a two-week treatment with him with traditional people diet. Oh, hey, a master plan to try to help clean out the drugs out of him and eight ayahuasca ceremonies. So a large body of research is supporting limbic disturbance and addiction. Huge body of research. It's being defined very clearly. So he went through it, you know, he had an incredible healing experience. Six months later, he just wrote me an email. He's clean and sober and happier than ever. You know, he's not every person that comes through, but it's like a very interesting example that we need to explore. Next slide. He wrote me this email. It's now been six months since I made my desperate last attempt to try to save my life and find some sort of peace of mind in this world. June 18th, I stepped into the Amazon completely devastated. I had lost everything I loved. I was at death's doorstep due to substance use, and I hated everything about myself. Things had never been as bad as they were in June, and I knew I was very close to the end. Then six months later, it's now nearing the end of December, and six months later, what has become of the man who lost his soul and begged for mercy from the plants of the Amazon? My life and the very existence I've ever known has completely transformed. I have experienced things in the last six months that I never believed possible. I live a caliber of life that most people would die for. I'm clean, sober, healthy, and most of all, Joe, I love myself. That was the key. Next slide. He went through some pretty rough ceremonies in those two weeks. You know? He wasn't living the cleanest life you could imagine. You know? And it was hard. First couple ceremonies, hell. But he was dedicated. He wanted to do it. He's like this or die. So he kept going and we support him and he kept going and we support him. Third ceremony, this is a unique case, you know, but he's just like, he found self-love. They showed him self-love for the first time in his life he experienced self-love. And that kind of deep, mystical experience of love, you know, I believe, you know, has a capacity to reprogram some of this epigenetic experience, some of the deep emotional suffering and trauma that he had before has to be overcome and redone and rewired and retold by, by that, by spiritual healing. Next slide. Love, you know, ayahuasca helped him cross into the mystery and find, you know, these four things that are like basically the crucial pillars of what ends up happening for people seeking spiritual healing to get through these kind of spiritual illnesses that we're describing. What are the mechanisms that you can use to, to cross out of that? How can you get through this limbic revision, this epigenetic reprogramming, self-love, you know, forgiveness, gratitude, compassion. And you need to feel it, you know, and talking about it and talking about it helps, but sometimes, you know, with the plants and the energy and the ceremony, you can feel it in a way that can change your life. Next slide. So I do believe our treatment works through spiritual phenomena, and I also, and I also that embodied consciousness does demonstrate manifestations in our physiology. Spiritual illness manifests in our emotional health and phenomena like imprinting in the limbic system, which I theorize responds to strong experiences in the emotional body, like ceremony and ritual. Next slide. That's it. Thank you very much. That's all I want to say.